The DOX series of amphetamines provides the opportunity to consider some strategic points regarding the introduction of an aromatic halide. Shulgin syntheses from PECAL all go via the intermediate 2,5-dimethoxyamphetamine made by the usual Henry condensation with a readily available aldehyde and subsequent lithium-aluminium hydride reduction. DOB is the simplest to make. Elemental bromine and glacial acetic acid performs a regioselective electrophilic attack, forming only the desired product. Bromine is fairly easy to handle, as it's a liquid at room temperature. Dock is more of a problem. The entry in Pical describes using a pipette to add liquid chlorine to the reaction mixture, which is difficult given that chlorine boils at minus 35 degrees Celsius. Even if you manage to add an accurate amount of boiling chlorine to the reaction mixture, it's a good opportunity to inhale some chlorine gas, which isn't very fun. To make things even worse, other workers found that the reaction mixture contained mono, di, and trichlorinated products after workup, and so they devised a more lengthy but less ambiguous way to install the chlorine. First, the amine group of 2,5-DMA was protected with an acetyl group using acetic anhydride. Next, a mixture of concentrated nitric acid and sodium nitrite was used to nitrate the ring. And then the nitro group was reduced all the way down to an amine using a hydrogenation which apparently took three days. Sodium nitrite in concentrated HCl was used to form the diazonium salt which involves attack of the amine group on the in-situ generated nitrosonium cation. The azo group was replaced with the chlorine in a Sandmeyer reaction with cuprous chloride, which is an example of a radical aromatic substitution. Copper wine donates an electron to break the carbon-nitrogen bond with nitrogen as a stable leaving group. The aryl radical then reacts with the chloride, reducing the copper back down to oxidation level 1. Finally, the acetyl group was removed by refluxing the compound for a day with sodium hydroxide in water and ethylene glycol. Shulgan made DOI by protecting 2,5-DMA as a thalamide, heating a mixture of thalic anhydride with a neat amine, presumably because the free amine wouldn't tolerate the conditions of the next iodination reaction. He used iodine monochloride, an interhalogen which is technically a solid at room temperature, but will still sublimate while you're weighing it and give you an interesting sensation in your mucous membranes. The iodination was straightforward despite the pickal entry describing isolating the product as a reddish glob floating in a yellow-orange opaque aqueous phase. Iodine itself can't be used for such an iodination, as it's not really reactive enough. Next up is the deprotection. Thalamide isn't as easy to remove as some of the nicer, more modern protecting groups, and it's necessary to reflux the compound overnight in ethanol with hydrazine, which also happens to be used as a rocket fuel, and is highly toxic. The side product of the deprotection is described in Pical as a cottage cheese-like solid, which is probably not much fun to filter off and recover your product from either. But difficulties aside, that completes the synthesis of DOI. If you wanted to avoid the thalamide protection and deprotection, maybe you could introduce the iodine earlier. Shulgin probably didn't do this because he wanted to work from 2,5-DMA as a common precursor, but this iodoaldehyde is accessible from cheap starting materials. 1,4-dimethoxybenzene can be doubly iodinated using a mixture of iodine and periodic acid in methanol. It's difficult to decide on the exact mechanism, so you'll just have to be happy that periodic acid, a powerful oxidant, generates electrophilic iodine species in solution, which are reactive enough to attack the ring. Whatever the nature of the intermediate is, pouring the reaction mixture into a solution of potassium sulfide reduces any oxidized iodine species and provides the bis iodo compound in good yield. Adding just the right amount of butyl lithium followed by DMF allows one of the iodines to be converted to an aldehyde group, and this reaction is probably a lot easier to carry out than the Vilsmeyer formulation or chloromethylation which we've seen previously. This aldehyde can now be condensed with nitromethane or nitroethane and reduced to give 2CI or DOI, respectively. One more compound in this family is worth considering, DOET. Shulgin was making all of these compounds in the days before palladium cross-coupling had been invented, so he needed to introduce the ethyl chain early on in the synthesis, doing a Friedel-Crafts isolation and then a very drastic Wolf-Kishner reduction, which involved refluxing the compound at 210 degrees in ethylene glycol with potassium hydroxide and hydrazine. After that, the formyl group was introduced by chloromethylation before following the usual route via the nitro compound. The Wolf-Kishner reduction goes via the hydrazone. Successive deprotonations by the powerfully basic medium force the electrons of the hydrazine down onto the carbon, and nitrogen is the eventual leaving group. Modern chemistry might allow us to replace one of the halogens of the previous compounds with an ethyl group, though, by selecting an appropriate coupling part of the aryl halide in a palladium-catalyzed cross-coupling reaction. It's difficult to add an ethyl group directly with this sort of reaction, although the Kamada coupling with ethyl magnesium bromide might accomplish it. With such a basic organometallic reagent, though, the amine would need to be protected from deprotonation. It's a lot easier to couple on an sp2 or an sp hybridized carbon. It might also be possible to do a stilly reaction with tributyl vinyl stannane, for example, if you don't mind working with nasty, toxic organotin compounds, then you could reduce the double bond to a single one. 
A better alternative would be to use the commercially available trimethyl silyl acetylene, performing a sonic shear terminal alkyne cross-coupling with an in-situ generated copper acetylide. Deprotection of the trimethyl silyl group should be easy with TBAF or methanolic potassium hydroxide, and the hydrogenation of an alkyne to an ethyl group would be straightforward with hydrogen and palladium on carbon. If the amine proved to be problematic with the cross-coupling, there's always the option of doing it before the reduction using the iodoaldehyde from earlier. Of course, then you have to worry about whether the reduction of the alkyne could also reduce the nitrostyrene. If it reduced the double bond, then you're left with an aliphatic nitro group, which might behave differently to the usual alpha-beta unsaturated nitrostyrenes in the final reduction step. If you wanted to reduce the alkyne before the Henry condensation, then the aldehyde would certainly need to be protected from reduction to an alcohol. As for how to choose the best strategy, the only way is to actually do the experiments.